This video was brought to you by Skillshare. 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 Dude, what are you doing? Come on. I know it's art or whatever, but I'm trying to do the intro, fine. Okay, great. <clears throat> This video was brought to you by Skillshare. Be one of the first thousand people to click the link in the description and get two months of Skillshare Premium for free. There we go. Kids these days with their art. Their art. It's, everything's art. Art! Art. <laughs>What's the most interesting rhythmic concept you've come across? Well, there's the most complicated, and that's probably found in the music of Conlon Nancaro. He wrote for player piano and had things like cannons at irrational ratios, E to pi, for example. Can't wait to tap my foot to that one. And a cannon at this ratio, which I'm not even gonna bother trying to read out because it's just so ridiculous. I think for me, the subject that I'm most interested in exploring is the concept of nested tuplets. A tuplet is just a way of dividing the beat in an odd manner. Normally we divide the beat in powers of two, eighth notes, sixteenth notes, etc. But you could also divide a beat in groups of five or seven or 23. 14 plus nine is 23. Musicians call these tuplets. And what's exciting about them is if you fit them in a backbeat situation, in between a kick and a snare drum in a regular 4-4 pattern, you get wonky rhythms that you can actually dance to and move your body to, and it doesn't sound like just a math exercise. What's cool, though, is that within this odd grid that you make, you can then add another layer. You can nest a tuplet within a tuplet, so you can tuplet while you tuplet. This kind of nested tuplet thing can still fit within a backbeat simple 4-4 groove. It just will feel wonky and weird. So check this out. Let's go over to Ableton Live real quick. So say we had this groove, and we wanted to fit five notes in between each kick and snare drum. In other words, we wanted to create quintuplets. The general rule of thumb for Ableton Live is to create one more note than the total number of tuplets. If we're gonna create quintuplets, we need six sixteenth notes. So, one, two, three, four, five, six. Hooray! We'll then select this group of six, and then using this handle, drag them over so that eventually, squeezing them down, we get five evenly spaced notes in between the first beat and the second beat, leaving this kind of runt note over. We can delete that. It sounds like this. Oh yeah, quintuplets, baby. We can then copy and paste these quintuplets over each beat in the bar to create kind of a quintuplet grid, and you know, move the notes around to create quintuplet grooves if we want. Sweet. But say we wanted to create a nested tuplet, a tuplet within a tuplet. Say we wanted to fit three notes in the same amount of time these two quintuplets take. Well, we can do the same thing, basically. Remember that rule with Ableton? You need one more note than the total number of tuplets. Well, the total number of tuplets is three, so we're going to need four total notes. We'll take these two, we'll double them. Then we'll take these four notes, click the handle, drag them over, and now we have three notes where there used to be only two. This gives us a triplet within a quintuplet. Very cool, it sounds like this. Okay, there it is. Well, since repetition legitimizes, repetition legitimizes, why don't we copy and paste it a couple times to hear it in more of a groove setting? Okay, it's pretty cool, but we can go even further. We can take three of that rhythm and then fit it in the same amount of time as two of that rhythm takes, so we can nest a nested tuplet. We'll drag it over and then it should look like this. All right, so how does this sound? Okay, sounds fast. If we double it and then we take those notes and put them down an octave, we can then make all of these notes staccato. And then, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I give you the state of music circa 2020, uh, doubly nested tuplet gent. so stupid, I love it. So this is the kind of workflow that the producer Phonon probably used when he made his EDM track Polyrhythm, which became kind of a meme in the EDM community uh, because people didn't really know what to make of it. It just sounded so weird, but some people seemed to like it. Honestly, I liked it, as well as my bandmate from Sungazer, Sean Crowder. He learned how to play the absurdly complicated nested tuplets in that tune live on a drum set. He recently released a video over at his channel breaking down the rhythms and how you might actually play it live. Go check it out over at his channel. The one thing that I'm now deathly afraid of is that he'll want to cover Polyrhythm live with Sungazer and I'll have to learn how to play them myself. Um, 
it's not a task that I am looking forward to, honestly, because that looks very hard. But hey, what we do in the name of art and memes, am I right? Which bass warmups would you recommend? I don't have much of a system. Most of the time I just go up and down scales in linear order. I also might practice them in thirds, like for example in C we go C, E, D, F, E, G, F, A, etc. Any kind of pattern that gets my fingers moving. The whole point, in my opinion, of a warm-up is just to get your fingers moving and get you feeling more connected to your instrument. If there's ever a time to just mindlessly noodle, it's during a warm-up. It's when I noodle the most furiously. Furious noodling. E major 9 over G. Oof. That's pretty intense. I might use an E augmented scale to improvise over that, which is just a scale that alternates minor thirds and half steps. It would sound like this. Hmm, kind of mysterious. I like it. Is music a universal language or is that only a Western idea? Um, I think you could consider it a universal language if you consider English to be a universal language, which I think very few people would. It's a widely spoken lingua franca, a means for different cultures to communicate with one another. But that definitely does not mean that it's universal, not by any stretch. When I was on tour in Mongolia with my band Aberdeen, we were able to play with traditional Mongolian musicians who are trained in the Mongolian conservatory system, which is based on the Soviet conservatory system, which is a Western system. And since we had Western training, we were able to communicate with one another very easily, even though we didn't speak Mongolian and they didn't really speak English. Can we start from the accelerando right after the... able to figure out how we could make our thing work with their thing, there's a lot of nuance missed with this discussion. In other words, to really get traditional Mongolian music, we needed to learn a lot more about the nuances of the style. The playing style, the melodies, the rhythms, the culture, etc. Just because we could jam with these traditional instruments does not mean that we speak the same language. There just might be enough overlap that we could have a meaningful conversation. And this way, music is kind of I want to say more of a pigeon. I don't speak the same language as a traditional Senegalese drummer or a traditional Japanese shakuhachi player, for example. I might be able to jam with them and play music with them, but that's not the same thing as speaking a language, I think. Even the concept of what music is might change from culture to culture. In certain cultures, music, dance, ritual, and religion are all part of the same thing. And that idea of ritualized community music making is way different than the idea of background music being played while you go to Starbucks. To call both of those experiences the same thing, a universal language, is just not true. Yes, both experiences might wiggle air around your eardrums, but there's a lot more to it than that. Is flute a jazz instrument? Definitely. There are some amazing jazz flautists that are working right now, like Elena Pinderhues and Sarpai, or Sharp Eye. It's a fantastically versatile instrument. It fits very nicely within the aesthetic of jazz music. But of course, most people will just think of the Anchorman scene and, you know. To hear Ron Burgundy play some jazz flute. <sighs> Such is the fate of the jazz flautist. That's baby making music, that's what that is. Oh. Jazz flute jokes. <laughs> Truly the highest form of humor. Can you play ukulele? Yeah, I love playing ukulele. What a cute sound. Can there be such thing as jazz metal? Well, you'll often find metal musicians who think that putting a major nine chord in the middle of a clean section makes it a jazz metal song, and no. The big thing is improvisation. Jazz is an improvised music, specifically a collectively improvised music. You have different musicians improvising at the same time and reacting to one another. It's hard to find that kind of thing in metal, although I'm sure you can find it. I think the band that definitely embraces the total package of jazz metal more than anything else is probably the band Panzer Ballet. Go check them out. Their Christmas album changed my life. Hey Adam, is there ever a good time to use a major seventh chord with a natural 11? So yeah, the natural 11 of a C major seven would be F. And if you play it harmonically, ugh, it doesn't sound very good. We're definitely in orange juice with toothpaste kind of vibe right now. 
<sighs> the reason, of course, is because of the minor ninth dissonance between the F on top and the E on the bottom. That is just very aggressive, but you can mitigate that by switching the two notes around. You can play the F on the bottom and the E on top, and all of a sudden, it actually sounds pretty good. It just goes to show that it's important to think very carefully about how you voice chords. This and this contain the exact same notes. It's just a minor tweak, which makes it sound very different. How do you make the graphics animations for your videos? I do all of the graphics in Sibelius. I screenshot the graphics, and then I drag them into Final Cut Pro. I don't really do any animation. Yeah, it's, it's really that simple. Make it in Sibelius drag it over into Final Cut. I study in a music school where they make sight sing in all the C clefs. Is that really necessary? If you don't know what a C clef is, don't worry, you don't need to know. A C clef is one of those things that you find in the clef menu of the notational software that you're using, and you think, oh, that's cool, and then never worry about again. A C clef is a clef where the line in which those two little squiggly things meet is C. It used to be common practice to move that clef up and down as the music dictated, so you never needed to have ledger lines. Then people realized, well, ledger lines are fine, and promptly stopped using C clef. All except, of course, <laughs> the violists. God bless them. The point is, is that it is an insanely archaic system, and the fact that you're having to learn this archaic system for the sake of learning it is Unfortunate. The fact that so many high school and undergraduate programs still require you to learn how to sight sing C clef is baffling to me, especially considering that they don't include things like digital audio workstations in their curriculums. <sighs> I guess, I guess, all right, I'm fine. Ooh, I have a question. Pick me, pick me, pick me. All right. I will. Why do jazz musicians like Stevie Wonder so much? It's impossible to reharmonize a Stevie Wonder song because the perfect harmony already exists and he wrote it. I guess you could deharmonize a Stevie Wonder song, but then you'd just be making it worse. Is being a musician a viable career during COVID-19? This lockdown is honestly one of the biggest events in the music industry in the past hundred years. Probably the only event of comparable change to how music is made would be the recording strike of the 1940s, where for a couple of years, musicians straight up did not record anything. Now, musicians are recording things. In fact, that's the only thing musicians can do. We can't do live performances anymore. We can't do tours. We can't do any of the things that normally we would be doing. I honestly don't know what the effect of this is going to be. In the beginning, I thought a lot of people would switch over to YouTube and Instagram and social media, and that kind of has happened but probably not as much as I expected it to. There are a few exceptions to this. Uh, my friend Brian Croc started a great YouTube channel. Go check that out if you enjoy my channel. It's a lot of nerdy jazz stuff. So if you like the nerdy jazz stuff, you'll probably like Brian Croc. But yeah, I don't know. Um, hopefully Sun Gazer gets to tour soon, but it might not happen until fall of next year. It's kind of crazy. Will we ever get to see you go ham on a jazz standard? All right, behold, the real book shall tell us our fortune. <clears throat> I love you. All right. Part of what has made the last three months just really hard, honestly, for me is the fact that I haven't been able to play music with other people. And playing jazz standards is one of those things, if you're a jazz musician, it's just a fun thing to do with friends. So in that spirit, I'm not sure if this will count as going ham, but I love you, everybody. I truly, truly do. And I just wish that, you know, we could make music with one another again, because that is one of life's great joys, and I miss it very much. <laughs> I Love You is a song written by Cole Porter for his 1944 musical Mexican Hayride. 30 years later, in 1974, the Grammy-nominated mix engineer Young Guru was born. These facts have nothing to do with one another, but I recently took a class taught by Young Guru on Skillshare on mixing and engineering. The class was full of all these really interesting tidbits of mixing knowledge that I hadn't thought of before. Like, for example, the idea of taking a static low sine wave and then gating that sine wave to the kick so that whenever you hear the kick drum, you're also hearing a beefy low sine wave sub, so you get a really fat and even kick drum. 
That's awesome. The class was full of all these little nuggets. I really enjoyed it, and I think you'd enjoy it too. Skillshare is an online learning community for creatives and curious people that features thousands of classes and things like illustration, photography, design, and many, many more. Most classes are under 60 minutes in length and feature short, manageable lessons designed to fit any schedule. And if you are one of the first thousand people to click the link in the description, you'll receive two months of Skillshare Premium for free. So check it out if you'd like. Thank you so much, everybody, for watching. And uh, thanks, everybody. I love you. It's jazz! Peace.